Morning. Today's first passage is Psalm 83, and it's on page 442. Hopefully I've got the right passage, because it says Jacob's preaching on Slam 82, so we'll see. Psalm 83. O God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. See how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning, they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, so that Israel's name is no, uh, remembered no more. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagrites, Byblos, Ammon and Amalek, Philist- Philistia, with the people of Tyre, even Assyria has joined them to reinforce Lot's descendants. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor, and became like dung on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like chaff before the wind. As fire consumes a forest or a flame sets the mountain ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they will seek your name. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know you, whose name is Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Second reading is Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, and it's on page 771. Chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that, uh, that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, were, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. This is the word of the Lord. Firstly, well done, Chris, for tackling all those names. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Jacob Osborne, and I'm a member of the congregation here at Christ Church Ballam. Uh, throughout the summer, Andy and Johnny, our regular pastors, have been taking a well-earned break, and other members of the church have been preaching through the Psalms of Asaph. I'll be preaching the last of this summer series, and I certainly need God's help, so let's pray, shall we? Father God, Thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a congregation and reflect on your word. We do pray that you will speak to us now through this psalm and that you will reveal your amazing truths to all of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I wonder if anyone in this room has felt a sense of betrayal. Well, a month before Christmas 2003, when I was seven, my mum promised that she would take me to Winter Wonderland at the Millennium Dome. Imagine a kind of wintry theme park with rides, candy floss, fake snow, and the occasional appearance of Cliff Richard. I looked forward to going with a huge sense of excitement. But Christmas came and went, and in early January, I suddenly realised that Winter Wonderland had closed for the season before I had had a chance to go. Mum had forgotten to take me. My seven-year-old self felt a crushing sense of betrayal. Indeed, for many years afterwards, I would cite this incident as a significant, albeit rare, example of maternal neglect. I'm sure many of us could cite similar examples from our own childhoods of some overly emotional response to a perceived injustice. But before I reopen too many old wounds, let's narrow down the question a little bit. Have any of us, I wonder, felt a sense of betrayal on account of our Christian faith. 
Well, we don't have to look very far to see examples of Christians being persecuted by their families and communities. At my parents' church in, in Streatham, there are two people from Somali backgrounds who have converted to Christianity from Islam. And as a result of this, they have both been cast out of their communities, rejected and betrayed by their families on account of their new faith. Well, if you're a Christian here today, you may not have been cast out in quite the same way, but you, you may well have family members, friends or, or colleagues who are suspicious of your Christian faith, who refuse to accept it, who make jokes at your expense, who talk behind your back. I even know that there are people sitting here today who have lost their jobs because of their faith. And if you're faced with a situation like this, you may well feel a sense of betrayal, especially when opposition to your faith comes from those who are closest to you. And if you're here today looking in on Christian things, this may well be a reason why you haven't yet come to faith. You might be nervous about how your friends, your family, or your partner might react if you become a Christian. What do we do as Christians when we feel betrayed or let down because of our faith? Well, Psalm 83 has some answers for us, so let's turn back to it now. The context for this psalm is laid out in the first few verses. So God's people, the nation of Israel, is surrounded by enemies, and they are crying out to God for help. So let me read again from verse 1. O oh God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O oh God. See how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. Do we feel the terror expressed in these verses? Look at verse 4. The aim of Israel's enemies is nothing short of genocide. They want to destroy them as a nation so that their name is remembered no more. They want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and establish a name for themselves. And verse 3 reminds us that Israel are God's people whom he cherishes. And so by wanting to destroy Israel in Israel's name, they want to destroy God's name. Hence why we read in verse 2 that Israel's enemies are your enemies, God's enemies. And in these opening verses, the psalmist is extremely distressed at what he perceives to be God's inaction. O oh God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Now, the psalmist knows that God is powerful. He knows that he is committed to protect his people. And yet he is still terrified at the prospect of God remaining silent. Well, if we look throughout history, this fear of a silent God in the midst of injustice is a common one. I don't know if anyone's seen the Martin Scorsese film Silence, but it portrays this fear very powerfully. The film follows two Jesuit missionaries who go to spread the gospel in Japan in the 17th century. They discover a group of what are known as kakure kirishitan, or hidden Christians, who worship God in secret because the state has outlawed Christianity. And these hidden Christians experience extraordinary violence and persecution from their fellow Japanese who do not accept their faith. And it's portrayed so unsparingly in the film that it's often difficult to watch. Several times the Japanese Christians ask, where is God? Why does he not save us? Why does he stay silent? Well, we may not be facing such state persecution ourselves, but surely this is something we can be tempted to feel when the cancer diagnosis comes in, when the relationship is falling apart, when a loved one dies before their prime. Where is God? Why is he silent? Well, the psalmist doesn't resolve this question immediately. In fact, he continues to describe this dire situation. Let's pick it up at verse 5. With one mind they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagrites, Byblos, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the people of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them to reinforce Lot's descendants. Well, that's an awful lot of names. And 
Indeed, Psalm 83 is pretty unique. It's the only psalm of Asaph which actually lists Israel's enemies. And examining some of the historical context behind this psalm helps us to understand who these people are. Now, I find history hugely interesting, and it's a source of continuing sadness to me that not everyone does. Um, so some of you might find this next section a bit technical, but I'd encourage you to persevere as we look at this together. We'll be out on the other side in no time. We think this psalm was written sometime between the 9th and the 7th centuries BC. So in other words, after the nation of Israel has been divided into two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And this psalm was written before God's people were exiled into Babylon. And we can see from this map the nations that are listed in our psalm. So Edom in the south, Moab, Ammon. Um, I've put an a, a arrow there so you can see where the Ishmaelites, the Hagrites and the Amalekites are. Um, Philistia on the left-hand side. The, the key point from this map essentially is that the psalmist is describing through this list how God's people are completely surrounded by their enemies. So it gives kind of geographic context to the psalmist's cry for help. But there's another reason for this list of names. When singing the psalm, the Israelites will have felt an enormous sense not just of fear, but of betrayal. Not because of geography, but because of family history. What do I mean by this? Well, here's a family tree of Abraham. Abraham, of course, was the, the bearer of God's promise to grow and protect his people. And Abraham was the ancestor of all the Israelites, you can see at the bottom in a purple circle. And all these names in blue and red were, along with Abraham, God's people. And yet, as we fast forward in history, look at what happens to Abraham's family line. The Moabites and the Ammonites are descended from Lot. The Ishmaelites and the Hagrites are descended from Ishmael and Hagar. And the Edomites and the Amalekites are descended from Esau. So all these enemy nations are descended from God's people. They're ethnically related to the Israelites, their family. And yet they are now God's enemies, and they plot against him. So for the Israelites at the time, the, the, the shock of this psalm, the shock of this list, is that the first enemies of Israel to be mentioned are not the Assyrians, the foreign nation, but the Edomites the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, all those nations who are ethnically closest to Israel. And this is emphasized in verse 8. Assyria, the foreign nation, reinforces Lot's descendants, reinforces Israel's family in plotting against God and his people. Psalm 83 is a song of woeful family betrayal. How does the psalmist respond to this desperate situation? Well, he turns to history, which brings me to my second point, the justice of God. I don't know about you, but I've always been both amused and petrified by the apparent lack of knowledge among Americans, both of the history of the world and of US history. A survey in 2018 found that 60% of Americans do not know who the US fought in the Second World War. Less than a quarter know why they fought the British in the Revolutionary War. And only 13% can say when the US Constitution was ratified. As one journalist puts it in his opinion article, when it comes to knowledge of American history, we are a nation at risk. And I know it's not just the Americans, but... The main point is that knowledge of history is not just about knowledge for its own sake. It's vital for making sense of the present and for understanding yourself, your nation, and other nations too. When the US evaded Iraq in 2003, leading politicians displayed a damaging ignorance of Iraq's political, social, cultural, and geographical history, an ignorance which directly contributed to the failure of that war. Ignorance of history is very risky indeed. Well, our psalmist is much wiser. He is not ignorant of his own history. And indeed, in this next section of the psalm, he reaches back into Israel's past and describes two amazing victories that God previously won for his people. Knowledge of history becomes a reassurance. It becomes something that gives God's people strength and identity in the present. 
from verse 9, let me read. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor and became like dung on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. So these names are essentially describing events that happened about 500 years before this psalm was written. So the names Sisera and Jabin in verse 9 are references to the Canaanites, a nation who were famously defeated by the Israelites. And uh, as part of this campaign, there's this really weird bit where a woman called Jael the Kenite drives a tent peg through Sisera's head. And this is a key moment in the battle. There's a painting of this moment. You may be able to see the, the tent peg by Artemisia Gentileschi. Not sure they would have been dressed like that, but there we are. <laughs> and all the other names in this section refer to the Midianites, another nation defeated by the Israelites. And there's another really weird bit to this story. God gives Gideon an army of only 300 Israelites to fight against thousands of Midianites. And God commands these 300 Israelites to blow some trumpets at the Midianites and smash a load of clay jars. And when this happens, the Midianites all start killing one another in fear. And you can read accounts of these events, historical accounts, in the Old Testament book of Judges. Why does the psalmist refer to these historical events? Well, have a look at verse 12. Both the Canaanites and the Midianites wanted to take possession of God's land, and yet they were defeated. The psalmist is confident that just as Israel's enemies have been defeated in the past, so they will be defeated in the present. Do to them past enemies as you did. Do to them present enemies as you did to Midian past enemies. His justice will prevail in the present as it has in the past. And do you notice how Jael and Gideon, who we've just seen in these amazing paintings, are not actually mentioned in the psalm? They are crucial human actors in these victories, and yet they are absent. The psalmist wants us to understand that God alone is responsible for these victories, that it is his action which determines the outcome and not the Israelites alone. Ignorance of history is risky, but knowledge of history can be a wonderful reassurance. And if we look at all the history that's in the Bible, there's a recurring theme of God using people and objects that are not all that impressive to achieve amazing things. The woman Jael and a tent peg, an army of just 300 men and some trumpets in clay jars. A carpenter's son named Jesus and a wooden cross. Indeed, just as the psalmist looks back to God's victories over the Canaanites and the Midianites, so we can look back to Jesus Christ's victory over sin and death. Just as the psalmist is confident that God will remain faithful, so we can be confident that God will protect us from those who would seek to undermine us, to belittle us, even to persecute us. And that confidence in each case is based on history. That's why uh, Chris read so wonderfully the beginning of Luke's gospel this morning. Luke describes how he has carefully investigated everything from the beginning regarding Jesus' life so that we may know the certainty of the things we have been taught. Jesus, the Son of God, really came down to earth. He really died. And he really rose again. And these historical events give us the possibility of a restored relationship with God. That brings me to my third and final point. When times are tough, remember your history. So in this final section of the psalm, the, the psalmist develops this theme of calling on God to take action against his enemies. Let's pick it up at verse 13. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like chaff before the wind. As fire consumes the forest or a flame sets the mountains ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they will seek your name. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, 
that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Well, we shouldn't underplay the, the, the drama and the violence of this final section. Look at the words the psalmist uses. Tumbleweed, chaff before the wind. God is called to terrify his enemies with his storm as, as fire consumes a forest. It reminds me of those terrible forest fires we saw in California and southern Europe throughout this summer. It's an image of God's judgment that is actually quite scary. And I suppose this section of the psalm might be a bit tricky to deal with. The psalmist is explicitly praying for the destruction of Israel's enemies. How does that fit in with Jesus' command to share the gospel and forgive our enemies? Well, what does this psalm actually say? Let's zero in on verse 16. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they will seek your name. And verse 18. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. So, despite this family betrayal the psalmist is actually praying for God to act against enemies so that those who reject him might come to know him. He's offering his enemies the possibility of redemption. That's the tension of this final section, that we can both pray that those who reject God's rule are judged by him, but also that they come to know him as their Lord. It may feel strange to us, but for God, there's no contradiction. His judgment is fierce, but it is also deeply generous. Betrayal and injustice matter to God. When Christians are betrayed by those closest to them because of their faith, when they suffer because of a sinful world, God sees this and he will judge this. And this is wonderful news, especially when the justice in this world so often fails to satisfy it is wonderful news for Christians around the world facing severe persecution from those close to them. But it is also wonderful news for us because we know that God will ultimately triumph over evil. But Psalm 83 teaches us that it's possible, indeed necessary, to pray for God's judgment of a fallen world while also praying that those who have turned against him will come to know him as their God. This is something we do very regularly at CCB in our small groups and in our prayer meetings. We pray for our friends, for our family, for our colleagues, that they might come to faith in Jesus Christ. What is our faith based on? Well, let's read again those final few verses of the psalm from, from verse 16. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they will seek your name. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Our Saviour, Jesus Christ, knew what it was to be betrayed by one close to him. He knew what it was to be condemned to death because of the testimony of a close friend. And yet he still went to the cross. If we use the words of this psalm, his face was covered with shame. He was ashamed and dismayed. He perished in disgrace. And he did this that we may know that God alone is the most high over all the earth. In other words, in taking the punishment that a sinful world deserves, that we as sinners deserve for rejecting his rule, he has given us the possibility of a new relationship with God. And this gives us hope of meeting God in heaven, where he shall wipe away all tears from our eyes and where there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. I'll close with a, a story about an American businessman called Wes Yoda. Yes, really. <laughs> For many years, Wes has run a Christian publishing company, and in spring 2000, he received a call from his banker to inform him that the company was in debt. It emerged that both the vice president and the chief operating officer of the company had been gradually stealing parts of the business for their own companies. These two men, whom Wes had considered to be close friends, had led his business to the brink of collapse. Wes felt bitterly betrayed. He wept and raged at what had happened. And then months later, 
he was reading Matthew's gospel. He remembered what Jesus had taught when he came down to earth 2,000 years ago. He remembered Jesus' commands to forgive those who sin against us. He remembered Jesus' death on the cross. And after much prayer and reflection, he, he came to forgive those two men. Years later, he said this, I prayed for God's presence, and God answered in a way I least expected. He showed me the way to forgiveness, and forgiveness set me free. When times are tough, remember your history. Let's pray. Our Father God, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. We pray that, just as you have forgiven us, that we would forgive those who have betrayed us or let us down. We thank you that we have in the Bible such a rich historical record of your action in the world. Draw us to it more and more, we pray, and help us to be transformed by the teaching of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.